Good morning. My name is Glenn Hall. It is just about midnight, October 4th, about to turn to October 5th, 2022. After sleeping for about one and a half hours, I am the God of the universe, awoke me to begin giving me the first teaching concerning the mystery of the mark of the beast. I am now going to begin to reveal the mark of the beast. The time is at hand. I'm not going to spoon feed you with doctrine. You need to go read my books, The Separation that I wrote in 1999, When We Awake that I wrote from the year 2000 to the year 2002, and the book that I call The Mystery of the Beast that I wrote from 2018 until 2020. <clears throat> the Mystery of the Beast is all in video. I am republishing those to BitChute now. I've already uploaded seven or eight. Uh, all but a, a few are on YouTube still. YouTube does continue to take them down from time to time. There's something there they don't like. Uh, people to know. I teach a lot of biblical doctrine that you've never heard before. The church doesn't teach it. In fact, the church teaches exactly opposite most biblical doctrine. There is very, very little doctrine within the church of Jesus Christ that is true. I cannot take the time again to go through all of the basic principles of interpretation, nor even of the meaning of things that you should know very well by now, but you do not know. You don't even have a clue. For example, in scripture, what is food? Our food is to be God himself. Did you know that the very first Hebrew letter, the Aleph, is an old pictograph form is represented as an ox? Can you imagine that, God? represented as an ox? Do you remember what the sin was when Moses led Israel out of Egypt? Let's read that. Let's start there today. Moses had been on the mountain with God, Mount Sinai, for 40 days. And he gave, God gave Moses specific instructions for how to begin the priesthood. Specific, and I'm not going to go through those. It, the whole story begins in uh, chapter 18, and then 19 really gets to Mount Sinai. But 32, chapter 32. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, when the people saw Moses delayed, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, get up, make us gods, gods who shall go before us. As for this guy Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are on the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. 
So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And Aaron received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, they said, the people said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Who are their gods? The golden calf. Verse 4. Aaron received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. It's just that simple. He specifically worked and created a calf that he then represented as the image of the God that had just delivered Israel from Egypt. Hard to imagine, isn't it? And then verse 5. When Aaron saw this, when he saw that the people were worshiping this golden calf, he gets excited. He built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Well, what do you think they played? And I am, said to Moses, go down for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And I am said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you, Moses. I'm not going to read the rest of this chapter. It's a long chapter, and, it, and you need to read it, so go read Exodus 32. But I want to reiterate, the very first Hebrew letter is the Aleph, it's represented by a pictograph of an ox. If you go on the internet, you can find it. If you get the Et Sefer Bible, there's a chart in it that also has that pictograph, and it just looks like an ox head, a very primitive ox head. And so as I began to consider this teaching, what the Lord is showing me, I thought, why? Why would the first letter be represented by an ox? Well, go read Ezekiel chapter 1. In Ezekiel chapter 1, Ezekiel sees a vision of the cherubim. And the cherubim are these angelic beings who have four faces. Let's go ahead and read what it says about them. Ezekiel 1 verse 4. As I looked, behold, behold. We all need to behold. Do you ever behold? Do you ever look into the things of God? Behold, a stormy wind came out of the north and a great cloud with brightness around it and fire flashing forth continually, and in the midst of the fire, as it were, gleaming metal. Often God appears like this in visions. For example, the prophet Kenneth Fisher, he does, or he did, I don't know the last time Ken had a vision, but his work is worth reading too because he acts as a double witness to all that I've taught to this point. 
Verse 5, and from the midst of it came the likeness of four living creatures, or beasts. That word is beast. The likeness of four living beasts. And this was their appearance. They had a human likeness. Now, a human is a beast. We are beasts. We were created on the sixth day like the other beasts, like cattle. But each had four faces, and each of them had four wings. Their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the sole of a calf's foot. And they sparkled like burnished bronze. Under their wings, on their four sides, they had human hands. So they have calf's feet, and yet they have human hands. Chimera, isn't it interesting that we see and hear so much about cloning and the mixing of genes these days and the creation of, of beings that are not what we think a being should look like. And the four had their faces and their wings thus. Their wings touched one another. Each one of them went straight forward without turning as they went. As for the likeness of their faces, each had a human face. Okay? The four, so there's four of these cherubim, these beasts. They were living creatures, living beasts. Each had a human face. The four had the face of a lion on the right side. So you look at the human face, and on the right, you have a lion's face. The four had the face of an ox on the left side. And the four had the face of an eagle. So that would be behind the human face, or on the back side. So, again, you have these four faces. Human lion, ox, and eagle. Every one of these beasts in God's law is unclean for eating. The only one that is not unclean is the ox. Such were their faces and their wings were spread out above. Each creature had two wings, each of which touched the wing of another while two covered their bodies. And each went straight forward. Wherever the spirit would go, they went, without turning as they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches moving to and fro among the living creatures. Reminds me of the vision to Abraham way back in around Genesis 14 or so. And the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning, and the living creatures darted to and fro, like the appearance of a flash of lightning. Why would one of the faces be an ox? And why would the word Aleph be represented by an ox? Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew Aleph Tav, or the Aleph al alphabet, Greek, saying it Greek-wise. And the Word of God, the Bible, I'm talking about the Bible here, all of the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. The New Testament was written in Greek. And in John chapter 1, John teaches us that Jesus was the Word made flesh. So here we have the first letter of the Word, the first letter of the written Word, the Aleph, and it's represented by the pictograph of an ox. Why would that be? Now in John chapter 4, this is the story of Jesus and the woman of Samaria. 
the woman at the well. And Jesus asked the woman for a drink. And Jesus then, after she responds to him, he answers her and it says, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked me. And it says him, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, if you knew the gift of God, what is the gift of God? Well, he tells you, living water. The gift of God is living water. We must have water in order to live. So then we go on here and Jesus has a conversation with a woman and Finally, after the conversation, all the way down in chap, uh, verse 31 of chapter 4, it says, Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, Jesus, eat. Eat. Aren't you getting hungry? Eat. But Jesus said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? See, this is the way we think. We think in the natural, not the spiritual. But What's more natural than that? Then, you know, when somebody tells you something, you, you're gonna deal, it, deal with it in the natural. You don't, we don't think in the spiritual. Jesus said, the words that I speak to you are spirit and are life. That's in John chapter six. I say to you, the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. If you're going to go any further with this teaching, don't try to refute the things I say and then argue with me about what I say in the natural because I'm not going to respond. These words are spiritual. Jesus' words are spiritual. The Bible is spiritual. God is spirit. The time has come to transition from the natural to the spiritual. That's why the mark of the beast is so important. We are moving into a spiritual reality. We've been prepared to accept the mark of the beast in the natural. What do you think COVID was all about? Why did they work so hard to get everybody into a frenzy of fear and to do things that changed them in the natural, changing their DNA? You know what I mean? In the natural. But that's different than the spiritual. The goal is the spiritual. The mark of the beast is designed to change you spiritually. So, Jesus says, I have food to eat of which you know not of. He wasn't talking about people bringing him food. He wasn't talking about eating lunch. I have food to eat that you don't even know about. Well, that's true for me. Is it true for you? That's how I was able to get up tonight. 
I knew God was giving me food. I knew that I was getting revelation that I had never had before, and I knew he wanted me to, to act on it. And so I have food now to eat that you know not of. As soon as the disciples said to him, has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. My food is to do his will. But if you don't know his will, you can't. And that can't be your food. Verse 35, do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. That's a word for you, church. This is a word for the bride. Last year, the Lord gave me a word for the bride. Midnight comes. Christ is coming. And that was a true word. And... You haven't listened. You did not labor. Church, Christians, believers in Jesus Christ, you have not labored. You don't even understand what God's food is. Why? Why was why is the Aleph represented by an ox? Because God is our food. He's our food. I have food to eat of which you not know not of. I eat the body and the blood of I am. That's what sustains me. That's how I live. By every word that comes from the mouth of God. So God consents, in fact, his plan to be represented as an ox, as a beast. Now, isn't that amazing? God would lower himself to be represented by an ox? Well, wasn't that the offense of Christ? He lowered himself to become a man like everybody else? Lowered himself so much that he was born of a woman and then laid in a manger, laid in a feeding trough? What's a feeding trough? It's where the animals eat. Jesus is our food, but he is God in the flesh. I am our creator, the one who created the heavens and the earth. He is the one who came and was laid in the manger was laid in the feeding trough for us, to feed us. 
See, that's the doctrine of food. And the church doesn't know it. Communion, then. What is the doctrine of communion? This little funny thing we do, passing bread and drinking out of these little, little bitty cups? How ridiculous. Communion is eating God among each other. Sharing the food, the literal food, the literal spiritual food of God, of I am. You see, someone else prepared. The church didn't prepare. The church thinks she's ready for a big revival, a glorious revival. What does she have to share? What truth does she have to share? She knows nothing. She doesn't have a clue. She's poor, pitiful, blind, and naked. She's the church of Laodicea. She's been counseled to buy salve for her eyes forever. She can't see a thing, still can't see a thing. There is such a short time left, church, people of God, such a short time left, and you still don't even know what food is.